All right, it's the time. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to my session. My name is Raymond, and uh, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, tips and the best practice we have been using for years, uh, trying to develop a large-scale Node.js um, applications, frameworks, projects, you name it. Okay. Uh, let us uh, uh, by myself. So I'm a senior technical staff member at IBM uh, as part of the IBM API Connect uh, product. And um, I'm responsible for the open source loopback project development. Uh, before IBM, I was a uh, co-founder at Strongloop. Um, so Strongloop was a uh, Node.js startup uh, and was acquired by IBM in 2015. And I'm one of the creators of the loopback framework. And uh, for my career path, I'm now a very passionate Node.js developer. And I transitioned myself from heavy duty enterprise Java development. But I'm not going back to Java anymore. I love Node. OK. So before we start it, I want to get a sense of like, uh, how this talk is going to be relevant with uh, each of you. Right? So I think the first question probably is going to be very simple. I would expect I got yes from each of you. So are you working on any Node.js applications, frameworks, or modules? Right. So that's a very positive sign. Uh, second question, it's a little bit tricky. Um, would you think the project you are working on, it's a complex and large scale project? Good. Uh, then the number three question is, uh, you know, people have different views about large scale, right? So I would like to hear from you, uh, what would you classify a project as a, you know, large scale Node.js project? Any answers from the audience? Yeah, good one. We can buy a lot of developers. Uh, a lot of pull requests. requests oh, OK. OK, so that's a runtime perspective. You need to deal with a large number of uh, concurrent requests. Good one. A uh, lot of modules, yep. All right, all very great answers. Let's uh, look at how I see it and uh, how the team see it when we went through the same process for the last five years. First of all, um, the project involves uh, a lot of teams, a lot of developers, a lot of users, uh, basically a lot of people circling around the project, right? Secondly, uh, because it's a large code base, so you don't want to you know, have one gigantic thing, uh, one single module with uh, thousands of lines of code, right? So in the Node.js community, everybody is very disciplined to do smaller, fine-grained modules and uh, improve the reusability across the modules, right? So definitely, you want to have to think about how many NPM packages you're going to publish, right? And what's the dependency between each of them? And of course, nowadays, we all use a version control system, right? And most of you probably going to use uh, something similar as GitHub. Now we have to decide for all the different modules, are you going to host each of the modules as a separate GitHub repository, or are you going to collapse everything into one repository? Right? Number three, it's a you know, meaningful project, and uh, we see the value of a number of years. And definitely, we have to maintain the project. And developers can come and go, and we are going to have multiple releases. Uh, so it takes a while for the life cycle of, of the project to going on. Okay. So now I kind of going back to my personal experience and see how my work in the past could be relevant to have a talk over here. Okay. So uh, we have been developing this open source API creation framework in Node, and the project is called Loopback. And you can find more information about this project from Loopback.io. And yesterday, in Chris's talk, we just announced we have a core GA version of Loopback 4. Right? And some statistics about the project itself. So like, it's pretty popular. We have over 11,000 plus GitHub stars for one single repository. Right? And uh, the 
framework itself consists of like uh, 50 plus NPM modules. And the number of downloads, it's uh, reasonable too. Like uh, we see a lot of users use it, so we have to support a lot of users. And the developer-wise, we have eight full-time maintainers working on the project day in and day out, and we are getting a lot of pull requests from the community. So the uh, developer base is kind of big. And then the life cycle wise, like we started the project five years ago and we continue to push releases by releases, right? So it takes a while to, you know, get from grand zero to what we are, but we will continue to evolve and then maintain the project. Um, definitely we already had three major releases and uh, V4 was just up yesterday. So to me, this is really a large scale framework, okay? And uh, um, like uh, about one and a half a year ago, uh, we thought about, hey, we have been developing this framework for a couple of years, and we have uh, uh, quite a few pain points, especially from the scalability perspective. And when I talk about scalability, it's not really just referring to the runtime scalability. It's about how we run the project, how we get most moves uh, to have multiple contributors working on the project and how we organize the code base so we save time from the development perspective. We don't always have to, you know, working on one change, publish that to your NPM report, pulling back from another, you know, module uh, and creating, you know, multiple pull requests to fix the same issue across multiple GitHub repos, right? So I'm going to give you a little bit more information about so uh, we start with the early version of Lubeck. Now we just had a release of V4, and we're rewriting the framework from ground up, taking all the lessons we learned in building a large scale not just application. And I will walk you through a couple important perspectives and how we achieve that. Not only just for the code base itself, it's the, the methodology, how we collaborate, uh, how we uh, develop a, a flow that enable the collaboration between different parties, right? So the first one is fairly straightforward, right? So now you have a very large code base. You have to make some tough decisions. How are you going to split the functionality into different NPM packages and how you are going to host your you know, source code in GitHub with uh, one or multiple repositories, right? So we had some pretty painful user experience uh, for us as maintainers for the early version of loopbacks. So the theme we had before is for each NPM package, we are going to have a corresponding NPM module, right? Then think about Lubeck as a framework, we need to support so many different types of databases. We need to support so many different kinds of you know, security schemes. So we end up with a lot of NPM modules and a lot of GitHub repositories. Right? So that's one of the uh, pain points we have. And what's the consequence of that? Right? Think about if you have two modules that works together, and sometimes you have to fix a problem, Right? And it happens the fix have to go beyond just one module, right? So how do you deal with that situation with GitHub, right? So you, uh, you know, fix the code, you open a PR. Well, in this case, uh, even though it's the same set of fix, but it's being hosted by two different repositories, so you have to create two PRs, right? Then how you verify these two PRs work together, then you have to think about, well, what's your magic CI system that recognize some of the conventions. So we end up have to uh, build our own CI system uh, that recognize, hey, they have two separate reports, but we are creating a PR uh, to fix one problem. So we need to define the naming pattern and say, hey, the name of the branch has to be the same across two different reports. So we realize, oh, these uh, two PRs actually should work together. Then we have that sophisticated backend to pull them together. Right? So it's such a hassle, like uh, you really have to uh, sometimes create five or 10 different PRs for one simple fix, right? And it's hard to verify if that fix works well together, okay? And then for a local, you know, development experience, as a Node.js developer, we know we have to do NPM install to get the dependencies, right? 
So if you fix one thing in one module and you want to test with another module, you have to either install a local version of that package or you have to set up a, a private NPM repository, publish it to it, then put it back, right? Um, so all you have like advanced techniques, like an NPM link, right? So on the file system, you create symbolic links to link all the modules together to make no uh, and NPM happy, okay? So I already kind of talk about uh, how much uh, sophisticated magic we have to build into the CI to recognize the uh, cross-module uh, dependency patterns and uh, make sure we have a so-called like a top-down build, right? So what's the solution? In Nubac 4, we decide to utilize a utility module from the community, uh, which is a pretty powerful module. Uh, uh, so it's called Nena. And I have a link over here, so you can check it out. So basically now, we have one single GitHub repository. And under that repository, we have a bunch of subfolders. Uh, so most of the folders go under so-called like packages, right? And then you also have the freedom to define different grouping of packages, right? Then you just have to tell Nina, hey, these few locations have the NPM modules we hosted with this single NPM, uh, GitHub repository. Right, go figure out the dependencies and go figure out the, the linking of uh, not modules folder. Right? Then give us the utility to run a top-down build, run the uh, you know uh, pretty formatting, uh, doing versioning, doing publishing, uh, do all the good you know heavy lifting things for us instead of we reinventing the wheel with our CI system. Okay? So that's number one. The uh, second benefit now. It's one repo, right? You check out the repo, you do the work, and you push the work back, create a PR, right? No matter how many packages you're touching, one PR solves all the problems, right? And all CI, uh, Travis, or you know, whatever CI you use, pick up the chain. They don't even have to install any NPM dependencies for all these uh, um, under development modules, right? Just uh, go down from the root and discover all the modules and then link them together. Now you have all the in flight, you know, modules working together, so you run uh, mocha tests or whatever tests, um, it's okay, right? So that's second one. Uh, of course, as a side effect, you, you, you get rid of your sophisticated CI system, right? You just uh, config your, you know, dot Travis dot YAML and the Travis deal with it. That's cool. So that's number one. Uh, so I show you a little bit, you know, uh, scrap and uh, some of the artifacts we use. Um, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, talk into all the details. So you can find all this information from the link we have and uh, use this as a raw model for your future setup, right? Uh, since we um, adopt TypeScript and, uh, you know, at the beginning, TypeScript doesn't have a, a good way to handle large-scale project structure, meaning you have to build each of the modules by yourself and you figure out the dependencies, right? And recently, they introduced uh, um, capability, so-called like a project references. So it's very similar, like, as uh, NPM dependencies. Uh, so for each of the pro uh, type project pro uh, reference, you can define the relative paths to other projects, then TypeScript TSC is smart enough to traverse through the dependency graph and the build the things incrementally for you. So you have the ability to really just build incrementally to save uh, a good amount of time if you only want to touch uh, one of the package. If you want to force a, a complete build, you can do that. Uh, and uh, we create a bridge between Nina and uh, this uh, TypeScript project reference because uh, for Nina, we have all the knowledge about the dependency graph, right? So we just automatically publish this uh, uh, so-called references property inside the tsconfig.json to chain all the things together. Uh, switch gear. Um, you know, language choice is almost the most critical decision you have to make, right? So we are all Node.js developers. We love JavaScript, right? But I believe each of you could have some, you know, aha moment or oh, uh, moment, right? Because uh, it's super fast to get started with Node, uh, with plain JavaScript, right? So you can go as fast as you can. But 
in some cases, you, you probably, I mean, we, we are human beings, we make mistakes, right? So we mess up the typing, we, you know, uh, didn't do a good job to document how the option objects looks like. Um, so, you know, JavaScript is great, but there's certain cases that will cause some trouble for us, right? So for us, like uh, for Lubex 3.x, uh, because it's written in plain JavaScript, so that means we have a lot of hidden contracts. So only the original developers knows the intention of the code and have the understanding of some of the uh, built-in contract we have in mind and some assumptions. Uh, so if the developer is doing a good job, it's been documented and uh, we put everything into the JS doc, otherwise uh, you have to explore by yourself. You have to check out the source code and figure out, oh, Really, um, this option could be a number, that thing could be, you know, a, a, that depends on, you know, the order of the arguments. Uh, if the first argument is this, then the second one will be that, right? So a lot of hidden contracts. Um, then for us, uh, we have new developers joining the project, right? So it becomes a very tough journey for them because with such a huge code base and trying to figure out how everything uh, works together, uh, to fix one simple you know, bug or try to implement a new feature. So the learning curve is really deep. Okay? It takes a while for a developer to really understand the code base and be productive with that. And the number three, of course, uh, you have to learn from the, the previous developers. If you are lucky enough, they're still hanging around. Right? So you can check their, oh, uh, how does this signature look like? Uh, what are the possible options? Uh, yeah, so you need to have a lot of uh, human knowledge from other people. So in Lubac 4, we decided to adopt TypeScript. Um, and everybody uh, knows probably how TypeScript you know, complement JavaScript. And I don't think I have to sell that. But just a, a few quick points to uh, tell you why it helps the team to create a large scale, not large S project. Right? So first of all, TypeScript gives you a way to express the contracts. Either you add an optional typing to your you know, data structure or the uh, master parameters, or you can define the interface and some other things. And then the, the typing system in TypeScript is uh, pretty powerful uh, if you do it right and you save a lot of time to spread that knowledge, right? So basically you force the developer to document or capture the contract up from instead of leaving that hole uh, for the longer term to hurt you uh, productivity in the future. And secondly, because uh, we uh, have all the typing information, we have all the interfaces, then it becomes a soft documenting code. Right? Most likely you can use the ID, like uh, Visual Studio Code, right? So you see, oh, this uh, class has so many methods, and each of the methods might have a few different flavors, so I can use the IDE to help me code. Right? That's really helpful. And number three, of course, like uh, the compiler catches uh, a, a lot of issues, right? And uh, the IDE improves the productivity of the team. That's a very uh, significant game for us. Um, it works out pretty well. So I strongly recommend to check out TypeScript if you have some mindset to work on some complex projects uh, and try to maintain that over many years. So uh, for those who are not very familiar with uh, TypeScript, so this uh, screen gives you a little bit of idea why it matters to us. right? So the first version is uh, plain JavaScript. Uh, we try to uh, define a fine uh, one record method. Uh, basically say, this is a query. Uh, it's a little bit like a Mongo query JSON document. Then there's some options to control how the query should be done. Right? So for plain JavaScript, it's uh, simple. For any developer, write two lines of code. Uh, here we go. Right? And uh, uh, there's a lot of magic behind query. And there's a lot of magic behind options. Right? So if you are, you are a new developer, you really have to check out the reference documentation to find out how to use this API. Right? Second version, the TypeScript version, uh, if you are coming from Java or C Sharp background, you feel much more you know, friendly to you. Right? And even for plain JavaScript developers, I would recommend that too. Because 
this knowledge about the message signature, about the, the types uh, you use in the code, it's being well captured by TypeScript itself. Right? So you spend a little bit more time at the development uh, you know, phase, but it's going to help you in the long run. Uh, so we kind of talk about all the logistic and the uh, language decisions, right? So now we have pretty good confidence, like, hey, we have the TypeScript weapon, and we have the powerful Nina, uh, you know, multi-repo, uh, multi-module management system. So now we can lay out the scattering of the project and go up to speed, right? Now let's switch to the runtime perspective a little bit. Uh, Especially in you know, a framework like Loopback, we have to deal with a lot of different types of artifacts. Right? So we, as a framework developer, we want to create some abstractions. Say, uh, Loopback allows you to talk to multiple databases. Right? So we create different kind of connectors uh, enabling the communication to your database. Then we define different type of data sources to config the connection to your database. Right? Then for each of the data model, like say customer order, then we have to define these things. Right? Then when you try to expose this capability to REST API, to gRPC API, you have to define a lot of artifacts too. Right? So your runtime for any large scale Node.js application should have the ability to register and manage all these uh, different artifacts and resolve the dependencies for you. Right? So, of course, you can always use uh, NPM require right, by yourself, but that kind of creates a very uh, you know, tight coupling between the different modules, and it's very tough to swap up. You know, say, if you want to use a different hashing algorithm for your password, right, so you require one module, tomorrow you want to decide to use a different algorithm, you have to change the code. Right? Uh, change the framework code, not just changing the application code. Okay? So in Nubac 4, we built up the whole foundation from ground up with the introduction of a so-called inversion of control container. Right? So for those who are coming from enterprise background, it's not foreign to you, like uh, uh, dependency injection, IOC. Right? So uh, to some Node.js developers, it's all about overkill. But it really depends on your use case. Uh, if uh, we are talking about large-scale projects, applications, I feel this overhead is worth to have. Uh, and we make a very native and friendly to the Node.js paradigm, especially from the asynchronous interaction perspective. So first of all, like this container becomes the universal uh, knowledge base, right? So for the whole runtime, for the tooling, you have one single registry. Right? Each of the items have a, a pattern of the key, right? So you can identify them one by one, right? So that's a registry. Uh, secondly, uh, we have the so-called binding, right? So binding, basically, you map an address to a service provider, and that service provider could be in different flavors, as a constant, as a factory function, or could be a class, or could be a provide class with a dependency injection. Okay. Uh, of course, dependency injection is just a fancy way to resolve the dependencies and push the uh, resolved instance onto your code without asking the application developer to do an uh, explicit lookup. Okay. So, um, this slide, I give you a little bit of idea how the asynchronous um, dependency injection works. So think about we have this kind of different situations, right? So we uh, try to build a REST API for your user management, right? So we create a user controller, uh, expose all these REST endpoints. But for the user controller to be functional, we need to access a database, right? So we end up creating a user repository representing the database access capability, right? Then for um, the password, right? Sometimes you, for testing, you don't want to have a very heavy duty uh, hashing algorithm to speed up the, the test, right? And then in production, you might want to use a very sophisticated uh, password hashing algorithm, right? So that means the user controller has a dependency on the user repository as well as the uh, password hasher, right? So this way, uh, from the dependency injection perspective, uh, I mean, first of all, we register all the artifacts with a unique key, right, on the different namespaces. Then uh, when it's time to get a, a dependency uh, repository for the user controller, the runtime figure out how to resolve it and make it happen for you. So this is a little bit code, shows how you can utilize the TypeScript decorator 
to declare an uh, injection point. Right? So we support uh, construct level dependency injection. We support property level dependency injection. We also support master level dependency injection. So that works for different scopes. Right? Um, and uh, uh, for each of the injection point, uh, think about in this case, uh, we need to have, uh, for example, asynchronous way to create a user repository for the user controller, right? So that becomes the asynchronous resolution and uh, uh, Lubeck actually burning that logic to make sure like uh, we can uh, defer that resolution and whenever the promise is resolved for that dependency, then your user controller instance becomes available for consumption. Okay? Uh, so, again, going back to the framework and the large-scale concept, right? So we have to deal with uh, a lot of unknown extensions. Uh, one good example is um, if you try to come up with uh, uh, authentication, uh, you know, uh, middleware for your system, right? But different applications might want to use uh, different authentication providers, right? Somebody use a user ID password-based approach. Somebody use a OS2-based approach, right? So these extensions are really unknown to the framework itself uh, ahead of time. So you can uh, put a lot of efforts to create multiple reference implementations of the extension points, but you never fulfill the duty that somebody else have a different need. Right? So having the accessibility built in, it's uh, uh, critical to your success of larger scale, not just uh, projects. And we follow the same pattern, uh, a, a proven pattern used by a lot of large scale systems. So if you are familiar with uh, Visual Studio Code, right? So the editor has a lot of different things. And there's common things, and there's specific things for uh, different languages, different you know, formats, and it's all contribute as plugins, right? So this plugin is basically it's a extension to the system. And the system itself defines a small contract as an extension point, which defines the common behaviors you would expect from all these extensions. For example, the authentication provider, right? We probably expect we're gonna have a login method, and in that login method, it takes some you know, credentials, then it gives back a, a user ID or whatever information to tell if the login is successful or not, right? So these things uh, form the uh, nice organization between uh, what should be built into the framework and what should open to extension developers, right? So uh, a couple of things around here, uh, lots of artifacts, right? We cannot foresee all the possibilities. We have to keep the door open. And secondly, a lot of unknown feature extensions, right? You really want to embrace the community contribution and make it extensible so you can grow your ecosystem by different teams, by different needs, okay? Um, of course, uh, we don't know all the extensions ahead of time, right? So we have to use this pattern to embrace uh, the future contribution of extensions. So here's a little bit example I already kind of talked about that, right? So authentication component define the uh, extension point to support different kinds of authentication uh, strategies. Then we have this context, which is a IOC container, which is a registry with a lot of knowledge about the future contributions. Right? Then each of the uh, concrete implementations, the OS2 and the LDAP, that becomes extensions to your authentication extension point, and uh, you don't directly interact with the extension point. Right? You basically just register yourself against the uh, registry, and uh, we utilize the dependency injection to figure out you know, how many uh, extensions are available to the authentication, and the authentication extent point do the dispatch on behalf of the uh, user request. So uh, we uh, kind of organize the extension points and extensions and with the uh, dependency injection IOC container as a bridge right, to decouple the two things. Right? So this slide kind of show how we um, get them together. Right? And of course, like, uh, you want to bundle your extensions or your extension points into sub NPM packages. Right? And to, to facilitate that, we kind of introduce a so-called component concept. So component is basically a grouping of uh, service bindings. Like I say, from one module, you can you know, contribute uh, three controllers, uh, two data sources, or one password hasher. So you kind of describe these contributions. So when we bring that module into your application, it becomes part of your application knowledge base. 
Uh, we discover that and we bind them to the global registry. Um, yeah. Uh, so the other action we often have to deal with is uh, a chain of responsibilities, right? So think about the express middleware chain, right? One request coming, you have multiple middleware, you know, handling them, right? Or uh, for us, uh, we have a so-called booting process because we have so many different artifacts, controllers, data sources, you know, models. We need to piece them together, right? So when the application starts, we discover all the different kinds of uh, extensions and going through multiple steps because all these extensions might have dependencies to each other. You cannot resolve them in one shot, right? So you have to split that into multiple life cycle phases. Like we, we config, we discover, we know, we resolve, and then we start and stop, right? So uh, we end up building so-called like a sequence of actions which allows you to uh, glue all the sequential step-by-step -step processing together Right? So we utilize a few different patterns to enable the sequence of actions. One is the express middleware stuff. You just register one by one and hope the order is correct. Right? But in reality, that's not always true. Right? And secondly, we could create something like a coordinate, like the bootstrap itself is extension points. Right? Then we uh, accept multiple booters as extensions to that. Then the bootstrapper's job, it just walks through the booters face by face and give them chance to do the work. Right? Um, then number three, we try to do functional composition meaning we describe all the steps as a function signature, then you can compose the function by yourself, give you the best control. Right? So those are the different patterns we use. Uh, finally, like uh, when you create a larger scale application, right, you need to follow a lot of patterns and you need to establish the conventions uh, so that people can follow along with you. Right? And uh, to make that happen, uh, you probably have to do a lot of work to improve the usage trends and make sure like uh, users are happy with uh, the way how the system exposes capabilities to them. And to achieve that, we introduced the CLI. So CLI is a very useful weapon to you know, uh, get users to the same page and get them started right away. So we see the huge benefits of using you know, CRI for uh, frameworks or even larger scale applications because behind the CRI, right? So you can burn in your best practice, your templates, uh, your guidance into the template. Then with the CRI, give them the options to customize a few things Then they get a, a high quality uh, code to start with following the same uh, structure following the same convention uh, being advocated by the whole uh, you know, application structure or the enterprise structure, okay? All right, so it's about time. Uh, a quick summary. Uh, so we have you know, went through all the pain points. Probably most of you were either uh, been experimenting or you might run into these issues in the future. So that's why I'm here to share some of the thoughts we have and some of the tips um, which will make your life a little bit easier, right? So basically, it's all about different kind of scalability, right? So not only just the runtime, but how you scale the code base with uh, modularity, but <clears throat> without sacrificing the productivity, right? <clears throat> Number two, how you make sure you could have many developers that utilize um, your system metadata and improve the productivity and the maintainability over time, okay? Then from the runtime perspective, uh, how you make sure your large scale project is capable of dealing multiple artifacts and dealing with uh, unknown potential extensibilities, right? And how you nicely, uh, you know, have them together uh, without very tight coupling. Uh, number four, build up best practice, some of the conventions and guide your users through, you know, CRI, through the IDE, so that they can follow along with you, right? So when they do simple things, common things, they don't have to reinvent the wheels. But if they have to, uh, you know, adopt a new strategy, you know, create a CRI for that, so everybody can follow along, okay? All right, thank you. I have to rush through the slides. Uh, but if you have any further questions, um, stop by or you know, check out all these links. Uh, we are pretty happy to have a, a good conversation with you. Any questions? <laughs>